Hey everyone. So in this one I want to talk, in this video I want to talk a bit about some more kind of computer science theory. Um, specifically I'm going to talk about uh, asymptotic uh, notation often used, uh, let's see, notation, often used in the uh, analysis <clears throat> uh, of algorithms. Analysis of algorithms. This is a um, fairly important concept in computer science. It's something I use pretty frequently, but it's in my day-to-day -day work. Right. How do you analyze the performance cost of, of an algorithm? And it, it's really about estimation. And it's really, really worth noting that asymptotic analysis and algorithmic analysis is a good first step, but it's only the first step. Because you also have to understand things like how computer hardware works um, and so on. And I can, I can kind of prove that stuff out. So, uh, for, you know, another way that you might have heard this is like big O notation. There are actually generally five that are used. Um, I guess there's one that's used that I've ever heard used in the industry, but there are basically five. So let's, uh, let's talk about these guys. Now, the way that this works <clears throat> Is, is the question that we're asking is we have some algorithm, you know, f of n, where n represents some data size. So a very, very simple algorithm might be something like this. And this is just going to be basic pseudocode, but for each, you know, uh, value in some, you know, array, you, um, val you know, we can just do some work, right? <clears throat> or even better, if v whoops, is uh, equal to, you know, 100, whatever it is, then return uh, v. Or whatever we're going to do, return, you know, uh, index of v, right? This is a very simple kind of algorithm here. <clears throat> so we have a couple of things. Uh, thing number one is this array. And the length of the array, we're just going to call n because it's easier. How many times, and then this here, this part here, this guy, um, which I'll do in, I guess, purple. We're going to call this, at least I'm going to call this, the work. This is the work that we're doing. <clears throat> For every element in the array, we're going to do some work. And we have an early out, right? When, if we find it, then that's great. So the question that we're trying to ask is, what is the worst case? Typically, we're asking worst case. We could ask best case or something else. But what is the worst case of how many times our work is going to be executed? as a function of n. And, you know, we're in algebra, so we're not even dealing with, with specific items. If I were to make a specific claim, like n equals 500, right, then we have a concrete answer. How many times, what's the worst case? The worst case is that the last element, or really the worst case actually is that no element is 100 in this array. That's the worst case. In that case, how many times are we going to run work? Well, we're going to run work 500 times. We're going to run work once for every number of n. So in other words, we're going to run the work n times in the worst case. That's the essence of what we're trying to do here. So let's go back over here to this big O stuff. So there are <clears throat> five. There's um, big O. So big O is uh, essentially worst case. There's big omega, 
which looks like an ohm symbol, which is best case. And then they get a little wonky from there. They get a little kind of crazier to understand. There's theta, which is the, it's not the average case, but it's the bound case, which is kind of hard to explain, but I'll explain it in a minute. There's little o. <clears throat> little o's uh, worst case, but it's unbound. And again, I'll talk about this in a minute. And then there's little omega, which is sort of a W kind of looking thing, which is best case, also unbound. The really, I'm going to go really simple here. Um, I could write out the whole big crazy formula and maybe I'll do that for fun. Um, in fact, why don't we do that just for fun? Um, this is how nuts it can get, right? I'll just, I'll just write it out. We'll just do it. Um, the basic idea is that F of N is within the set of big O of G of N. And it's important to realize that this is a set. Um, if and only if there exists some constant called C, which is greater than um, zero, C has to be greater than zero, and some other constant n not uh, for for you know n or n you know sub zero for lack of a better term, that's just sort of what it is, um, which is greater than or equal to zero. Keep scrolling. So, uh, I'm actually going to move this to the next line. Such that zero is less than or equal to um, f of n, which in turn is less than or equal to that constant times g of n uh for all n's that are greater than or equal to n zero so there's a lot of stuff going here um right like this is the whole thing if you're studying computer science if you've ever studied computer science you know you might have seen this whole thing you know it's it's a little daunting i'm not going to go through it with any significant detail the whole point is how does it grow? This is specifically for big O. This is big O of n. Or this is testing for big O of n. Um, okay, so we're going back down here to our kind of happy place. So worst case, what do I mean by that? I mean, what is the worst case? So in this algorithm, the absolute worst case is that it's not there. So our worst case, the absolute worst it can possibly be, is that we have to do the work n times. Thus, it is big O of n. It is linear, grows linearly. And that's really what we're doing. How does the amount of work we have to do scale with the size of the data set that we're operating on? That's, that's the thing to really take home from that. So that's what big O is. Almost all the time I hear big O, and that's usually what we care about. Amusingly, people use big O incorrectly. They use big O when they mean theta or when they mean any other such thing. Um, best case, is it returns instantaneously. Our absolute best case is this algorithm could always return as the first element, which is not as useful as a statement uh, of a statement as this other guy. Now, when I say worst case unbound, <clears throat> so in, in a way, you know, if we want to sort of write some other stuff here, we could say that this is essentially, oh, I said worked case, worst. We could essentially say that, you know, this is similar to like, you know, less than or equal to or greater than or equal to or whatever, right? Like this is, it's not like the time involved is uh, no, is this is the, this is as bad as it's going to get. It could be this bad, but this is as bad as it's going to get. Worst case, unbound means um, it's not, a, it's, it's unbound, so it's not actually going to be that bad, right? Same thing with uh, best case, right? It's unbound. So it's, it's similar to less than or equal to um, versus less than, right? It, less than or equal to says it could be this or anything, you know, better than this. Um, whereas less than says it's better than this. It's not actually this bad. 
We're going to mostly focus, I just want to kind of point at this, you can look all this stuff up, I suppose. We're mostly going to focus on this guy. What is our worst case? This is what I hear all the time anyway. So we're going to look at big O stuff. Okay, let's keep going. In general, um, there are many kinds of, of ways to deal with, like many different issues. So let's, in, in a lot of these types of algorithms, you have constant time operations. So if we were to actually look at this, how many times do, you know, do each of the, the particular lines execute? So we'll look at another algorithm. Um, this particular algorithm that we're gonna look at is just gonna be sort of a, another kind of, um, you know, for each uh, V in array, for each V in uh, oops, array, you know, this is something you'll see sort of in games, right? Collide, and there, I have two Vs here, I recognize that, but this is just pseudocode, right? So <clears throat> loop through the entire, for every element in the array, for, uh, for each element in the array, we're gonna loop through the entire array a second time, and we're gonna to attempt to see if those two objects collided. Um, if I wanna make this a little more obvious, I might say, you know, again, just something simple for A in array, for B in array, and then we're gonna do a collision test for A and B. This is a very naive way of doing it, but this is gonna illustrate a point. How, so collide, right, what's our work? Collide is our work. How many times is this going to run based on the size of the array, right? Based on the value of n. So it's going to run, right? So here it's going to run this block is going to run how many times, right? This block by itself is going to run n times. So for each one of these, this block is going to run n times for each n. So in other words, it's going to be n times n. And what something times itself? n squared. So this is an n squared algorithm. So an n-squared algorithm, obviously much worse, it's going to grow quadratically, um, not exponentially. That's a common, um, that's a common, you know, incorrectness. A lot of people think that n-squared is exponential. It's not. It's quadratic. Um, quadratic and then and cubed would be cubic and then quadric and then quintic and so on. Uh, exponential is very different. Um, very briefly, I'll just do it here in gray. Exponential would be something like two to the n, where n is the exponent. And this two can be anything, but typically it's two to the n, um, just because it's, you know, d uh, what algorithms tend to be exponential look like this, but it's really anything to the n. So where n is the exponent, um, that's exponential. That is, you know, if you have a, a, a two to the n algorithm and n is of significant size, you will be waiting until after the heat death of the universe for your algorithm to finish. So probably you avoid that. Things like, um, oh, propositional logic, if not done well, can be two to the n, for instance. So um, this is an n, so, you know, back to this guy, this is an n squared algorithm, right? That's, that's what this guy is. Um, generally bad, uh, so these are places to optimize, of course. Um, collision is inherently uh, an n squared problem. You can get around it. Um, my own engine, for instance, gets around it quite well in that only things that actively move ever try and care about collision. So if everything is moving, then yeah, everything has to detect against everything else. Um, you know, you can, you can sort of, you know, A colliding with B and B colliding with A are the same thing. So, you know, you can sort of clean this up a little bit. You can do, you know, spatial partitioning. There's all sorts of things, but it, at its absolute root core, these are optimizations on what is inherently an n-squared problem. Everything has to collide with everything else. You have to check for that collision, right? 
So that is an n squared problem. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to choose a color that is just going to carry me over. And maybe it's this white color. So this algorithm is n. This algorithm is n squared. Let's do another fairly common one. So here's another one. We're going to do, um, I'm probably not going to draw the whole algorithm for this, um, but I want to just very briefly show you what this looks like. This is an array. We know one thing about this array. We know that this array is sorted. And we want to try and find a value in that array. The easiest thing to do in terms of finding this value is to cut the array in half and say, OK, I'm going to go here. Is this uh, here? Is this the value that I'm looking for? If it's not, I know what direction to go in. I can go left or I can go right. Maybe it's less than. So now I've cut this guy in half. Is this the value I'm looking for? No. Is this the value I'm looking for? Yeah, it either is or it's not in this list, right? I'm cutting the problem in half every time. You may have seen this before. Um, if you've ever played around with trees, binary trees, right? It's the same thing. The general rule for a binary search tree is that if I am less than the root, I go this way. If I'm greater, greater than the root, I go this way. So I have two directions that I can go in, and, and you do that at every, at every level. Assuming a balanced binary search tree, you know, again, you're cutting the problem in half every time. So what's n in this case? So n is the number of nodes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So in this case, um, n equals 15, right? We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15. Here, n is 7. How many nodes did I have to touch, worst case here, worst case here, right? I only had to touch 3 in this case. And in this case, if I'm searching through, it's 1, 2, 3, four nodes, right? I'm touching four nodes. I'm asking that question four nodes out of 15. Specifically, if I want to do it as a function of n, um, the easiest way to look at this is as a log, base two log of n. In fact, that's what this guy is usually called big O log n. It is worth noting that when you're talking about uh, this tree here, um, I'll do it in gray, I guess. Another way to consider this is that this could be considered big O of h, where h is the height of the tree, right? These are the different sort of levels of the tree. And that's a reasonable way to look at this. And often you may see this as well. This is 100% correct, even for unbalanced trees. But for a balanced binary tree, log n. <clears throat> OK, let's do another one. Assume that I have some array. And I want to return that, that an index into that array. right? Let's say that I want to return um, the ith index. right? I'm going to actually write a function for this. So I'm going to say, um, int, you know, get, it doesn't really matter. And I'm going to have some size t, which is the index. And I'm going to have some, um, and that's fine. And we'll just use a, a global, right? It doesn't matter, right? So what does this get? This is going to be return array sub index. This is pro and this isn't even really pseudocode, right? This is literally my whole function, assuming a, an array somewhere, right? This is it. So what's the complexity of this function? Well, it just happens, right? Another one is like, let's say that we want a function that multiplies 6 by 4, 
or just even the multiply operator. Like, what's the asymptotic complexity of that? And that's maybe a, a bad example, but a better example is this array has some size of n, right? This has some size of n. Well, what's n? And how does the performance change as n grows? The answer here is it doesn't change. I don't care if the array has two elements or if the array has two million elements. This, asymptotically, this performance won't change. It does not change based on the growth of the array. Now again, we're ignoring real world things like CPU cache because that will affect things. But in this case, purely theoretically in a perfect world, this will not change at all. We call this big O of one constant. It doesn't change. So that's what this guy is. Big O one. This is a constant time operation. This is the best operation, right? Constant time. Now I'm not going to go into the full algorithm for this kind of thing. And uh, I don't fully have time to go into like all of the mechanics of it. But let's look at another one. <clears throat> let's look at literally just um, the STL function standard sort. Now under the covers, there's it doesn't prescribe what it is, but it's typically some variant of a quick sort. Um, specifically, it is often uh, something called an intro sort or an introspective sort, which is a quick sort that devolves into other sorts to guarantee a particular complexity. And so essentially what you end up doing is you, it's a combinatorial thing. For every, um, you walk through the entire uh, array and for every value in the array, you essentially do this divide and conquer log n operation. So I bring this up and again, like I'm not, it's beyond the scope of this to actually like implement a, a, a quick sort. Although I suppose we can look at it. Um, I could I suppose I can literally just Google it. Uh, yeah, Wikipedia is probably good. Yeah, here's the algorithm. Uh, this looks right. So it does this partition. Um, and uh, so this partition, it basically chooses a pivot point and then chooses a partition. Uh, you know, there's a partition that it uses to pivot and then it sort of runs quick sort on each thing and has to do this for everything. So it ends up being uh, n times log n, which is pretty common. Now, um, my f one of my favorite joys in this world, and I show this to all of my classes um, because it's really, really beautiful. And I, I'll probably, I'll probably link to this at some point. But it's these guys, uh, the algorithmics. Here's quick sort using a Hungarian dance. Um, can I just go to these guys? Yeah, here we go. So like, I'm not gonna run this whole thing uh, or even run through this, but these guys' page, they have a, they have like a few, but it's basically quick sort. Um, and you know, there's a binary search here, which we can look at in Flamenco. And so I like, I show this to, to all, here's the full video list. Um, I show this to all of my students uh, whenever we're talking about this stuff, right? I always show it to my students because it's such a beautiful way to show the internals of how these work. Anyway, you can watch it. I highly recommend that you watch it. Quick sort and other, and most of these types of sorts are uh, big O n times log n. So this is just another very common asymptotic complexity. So what have we got? We've got n, n squared, log n, constant, and n log n. There's a couple of other ones that are not super common, but are pretty easy to kind of deduce, right? There's other, there's n cubed. Probably if you're in n cubed land, you have failed somewhere significantly. One of my favorite assignments that I give students in my optimization class is I have a collision system that is n to the fourth. It's one of my favorite things I've ever written. It's so bad. Um, and they have to optimize it. Um, and then the other one that's, that's 
again, not common, but worth noting is exponential, 2 to the n. Um, and then this is, you know, like a deeper frown. Like you've, if you are, if you're doing either of these, um, you have lost the game, right? You've lost somewhere. You should never do this stuff unless, like 2 to the n, I mean, unless n is some um, microscopic value, right? If we just do the math, let's say n has the value of 5. That's already 32 values. Let's say n has a value of 100, right? What is that going to look like? x to the y. Bam! Look how, look how massive that is. How many iterations am I going to do? How long is that going to take for 100 elements? What about for 25 elements, right? Like 33.5 million, 33 million iterations. That's massive for 25 elements. And n cubed is not that much better, right? So if I have, you know, 25 or whatever times 25 times 25 gives me 15,000. Like these are not good values for just 25. So um, these are the major complexities and examples of kind of when they come into play. Um, and just a good way of just sort of thinking about this stuff. Now, when you're analyzing algorithms, a really important thing to do is to realize that real algorithms are going to have many different consequences. Um, if we look at if we look at a relatively straightforward yet complicated algorithm, Dijkstra search, the algorithm is down here. So let's think about this, right? If we just look at this algorithm and let's do this and I'll kill this layer and this guy. So if we just look at this algorithm right here and we just start thinking about what's in this guy, you know, what are the different data structures that I have? Create vertex set Q. Well, what's Q? You know, I have this Q thing. Well, they're kind of treating it like a Q, right? We have to add things to it. What are the operations that we're doing to it? Um, well, we have to grab something with the minimum distance. So like, what's the asymptotic complexity of Dijkstra? Well, it's a combination of things. This right here, depending on how you implement the Q, could be any number of things. If it's a sorted list, this operation um, is going to be something like, oh, it doesn't show up that well. It's going to be something like a uh, constant. But then somewhere I have to actually sort it. Right, because in here, where are we? Uh, and forgive me if you're not super familiar with something like Dijkstra, um, you know, and we need to remove it, right? That's gonna be its own thing. But anyway, somewhere down here, where are we? Uh, for neighbor, if, yeah. So like going through all this kind of stuff, like this Q, um, we've only added this vertex to the Q. This Q keeps has to keep getting like filled with more and more stuff, right? So for each neighbor, it's gonna go through and do a bunch of stuff here. But these guys end up getting added to the Q over and over and over. Um, and that's kind of what's happening sort of down in, uh, somewhere in here, I'm not seeing it in here. Alt equals distance, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, this Q has to get filled. Uh, or else like this by itself is not going to do anything because we've, oh, this is adding every vertex to the queue. I see what it's doing. Yeah. So then at this point we would have to sort. That's one way to do it. You know, so we could sort here. Which we know is going to be some kind of n log n. And then that would at least give us here, but minimum distance to u, u is going to change in some different ways, right? So it's like, how are we going to start? So my point being here is that each of these sort of operations in here, what is the actual cost of all of this stuff? Like these things are going to start adding up, right? If this is done poorly, there, there are sort of bad and good ways to do all this kind of stuff. Um, in fact, this Q often, by the way, this is called the open set. Um, your choice for data structure for the open set is going to determine a lot. Um, 
commonly you use something like a heap that's a reasonable thing which is essentially a priority queue whatever you want to call it and you get log n for many operations which is nice so you know you have to really consider that kind of stuff okay so let's look at a couple other things you know if we go to something like vector standard vector cpp reference if we look at any of these kinds of things we're going to see a bunch of different uh, terms. So one, th uh, one thing I do want to do before I continue, because this is going to use slightly different terminology, is I want to go back to these guys. And I want to give you a secondary terminology for this. Um, this right here, no, I don't care about you. This right here is called linear. This is a linear operation. This is quadratic. This is logarithmic. I think it's logarithmic. This is constant. Constant. I don't think I've ever heard this called anything except n log n. This is uh, cubic. This is exponential, exponential. So these terms will become uh, very important in a minute because here is standard vector and various functions. So in CPP reference, you will find that these guys have stuff in them. Uh, insert, insert elements. It inserts a bunch of stuff. How slow is this? Let's look. Complexity. So there's, you know, what? Five forms. Here are the five different forms. Form one and two uh, are constant plus linear in distance between pause and end of container. So what are these guys? So this is, I give it an iterator. I say insert some value at some iterator. That's one and two, it looks like. So if we think about what this looks like, let's go back to this guy. If we think about what this looks like, um, let me kill this and this, go back up here. And I'll actually delete you and add a new thing. There we go. Okay. Um, I guess that's already highlighted. Good. So if we create like a little array like this, here's my array. And I say insert to at some position here, insert some value. It is constant plus, so constant, plus linear in distance between pause and end. This is pause right here, and this is end. So this distance, whatever this is. So it's big O of basically end minus pause, right? This is the complexity. So this constant is almost sort of useless. It's basically this constant. I mean, this constant goes away, right? So this is the cost. And of course it's the cost because what it has to do is it has to insert your item here and then walk everything up. So that's what it's doing. So that's the cost. If you're inserting at the end, it's basically constant. These other guys, right? Linear in count plus linear in distance. So, you know, because uh, so form three adds a, a range of things um, and some of these other forms do as well. So this is how you can kind of read this stuff, right? What is the cost of clearing an entire thing? Linear in size of container. So calling the clear function is not fast. It's actually slow. Um, right? It's, it's, it, and it has to be. So if I'm going to destroy all of these elements, you know, uh, typically a vector is three pointers. Uh, one pointer that points here, one pointer that points to sort of the end, and then one pointer that points out here, which is your capacity. And then this is the size. Those are two different things, right? Vectors resize. And then this is the start. And so uh, it can't just take size and set it here because these could be constructed objects. So it has to loop through all of these and call a bunch of destructors. So it has to be linear. But that might be surprising to some people, like, oh, really? Oh, right, it has to loop through everything. 
So this tells you right here, and that's, that's where this stuff becomes important because your job as a programmer is to know stuff, right? You're, you're like, if you're a Game of Thrones character, you're Tyrion Lannister. Your job is to drink and know things. Swap, swaps the contents of two, of two vectors, right? That's gotta be linear, but it's not. Because literally what it's doing is, as I said, it's these three pointers. It's literally just swapping these three pointers, right? It doesn't matter what the memory is. It just swaps the pointers with the other, with the other vector. So that's the whole point of this stuff. Like we can look up any STL data structure and now we can kind of read this stuff, right? Well, how fast is a map? You know, how fast is it to insert into a map? Well, let's look at complexity. Here's the here's a myriad of different uh, think. Oh, down here are things. Average case is constant. Worst case is size. Well, of course it is. If you have a terrible hashing function, you know, it uses chaining essentially to to deal with that. If we dig into how hash tables work, right? Or let's look at. Um, Regular map. Maps are implemented as binary trees, as I said before. Um, or, you know, my, my sort of example of binary trees, which uh, this guy up here, right? So this, this sort of split here. So that's what it's implemented as. So if we look up insert, we see, or actually let's look up find, because that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, find. Complexity, logarithmic in size of container, right? Logarithmic. And that makes total sense if we go back to this thing because it's kind of what I said, right? We're just going left, right, left, right, whatever. So it's logarithmic, logarithmic, big O of log N. So that's that's kind of the thing. And you can do the math on all of these values, right, if you want to. Um, and just, just for fun and for simplicity, I'll just sort of sort these, right? Um, whoops. So in order, constant time is best. If you can't do constant, log n is decent. It's actually really good. If you can't do that, you default to linear. If you can't do that, you know, log n is sort of its own thing. n squared, n cubed. And finally, two to the n. <clears throat> and so in order from best to worst, this is kind of what you're looking for. Cool. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of other stuff that goes along with this kind of asymptotic complexity, um, you know, that I just like digging into this whole formula, which I'm, you know, I can do in another video if people want me to like really dig into this and do the mathematical examples. I just felt like I can't really do a video on asymptotic complexity without actually at least showing some version of this formula. Um, most of the time we worry about worst case and most of the time, you know, it's, it's for, for daily stuff, it's like I'm choosing, how am I choosing my data structures and my algorithms? That's really where this comes down to, right? So it's like, which of these things am I gonna kind of choose and in what situations am I creating these types of, of, of issues? So that's the, that's the whole idea of um, asymptotic complexity. And it's just, I'm just scratching the surface and I'm trying to approach it from more of like a utilitarian point of view. Like this is how I actually kind of use this. Um, now some exam, like I have examples of this kind of stuff. Like I do this sort of thing all the time in my own engine. So like I have a string ID for instance, which I'll show briefly. Um, and a lot of times in the comments, you'll see this. So like, in the comment, like here in the comments, like I just have it listed out, you know, construction and assignment is, is, you know, linear. Uh, this one is linear, but it has to go through twice, right? Hash lookups, right? Constant time for some of these other things. So I just, I very, a lot of times in these cases, I will um, write out some asymptotic complexity. You can probably search my entire engine for big O, like an uppercase O and an open parenthesis. And uh, there's, a, well, I guess, yeah, there's a, you know, there's several of them, right? And I can just sort of start walking through these. 
you know, here's another one. Uh, this is all still string ID stuff. Like if I just go to some random other thing, resize is great, expensive, requires big O of N in memory and big O of N in move operations. I don't even know what function I'm in. Uh, oh, some grid partition. Yeah, it's a, a spatial partitioning system. Um, here's another one. Size is in cache. Yeah, so this is just for letting me know that, hey, in my quad tree implementation, calling size, like I don't cache it because it's rare that I care about size. I don't even know if I'm calling this function anywhere. Um, so I don't cache it. So I just, I have to count all the things. So this is a, a linear operation. You know, here's another one. N plus N log N. Um, is this sort of sad complexity for some other quad tree operation, right? Um, if I dig into some other thing, worst case, could be as bad as n log n, right? Which means every item in the queue has to run, you know? So it's just like, you can just kind of see, here's a crew filter that I'm doing uh, in the space sim game, iterating through a list of uh, crew as big of n in time and constant in space. I'm just, you know, this is where I do this kind of stuff. So it's like, okay, you know, what is what is the worst case for a particular object? Here's one that's big omega of n, right? This is like, no matter what, it's going to be n. Like, I just have to do it. So my point is that then, you know, if I'm looking at some function, you know, a really good example was this quad tree function from before, although I don't think I have that open anymore. Um, we're down here, like, I have a comment here so that I can make it a... a an informed decision about what I'm doing. Oh, size is not cheap. You might expect it to be cheap, but it's not. It's a big, uh, here it is. Yeah, it's a recursive sort of call where I'm getting the number of elements based on this root, which in turn will sort of recursively call the children calling get total number of elements. So it recursively walks down the, the quad tree to find all the, all the elements. Um, so that's my point. Like it's good to know, even in your own algorithms, what the complexity is. I have to walk through every node in this entire tree. So it's N. I mean, it has to be. That's the only way to make this work unless I cache it. And I'm not caching it because uh, I, it's such a rarely called thing that it wasn't worth incurring that cost. Cool. Well, I hope this was helpful. Um, as always, let me know if you have any questions. You know, give it a big thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, post any comments or anything that you have. If you want me to go deeper on any particular subject, let me know. Um, I'm happy to, like walk through the insanity that is this thing. I teach this, I, I, I teach data structures and algorithms. Um, and when I teach asymptotic complexity, it is a brutal class because we walk through this whole thing. There is no demo. It is a three hour lecture of me going through this formula and showing all of the different examples and how all the different performance growth rates work. And there's zero code, it's all math. And uh, students often have an aneurysm by the end of it because um, the, the complexities of this are really hard. So hopefully in this little, we're up to 42 minutes or so now, 43 minutes, hopefully in this relatively short video, I was able to at least give you a taste of the practicality of this kind of stuff. Um, I've mentioned this before, but my final caveat that I'll say is this is the magic of theory land, you know, and in theory, this is all works exactly like this in practice. But of course, in practice, theory goes out the window. So that's another thing that I might do as a continuation of this video is talk at least briefly about the real world. Because the real world, sometimes linear, I mean, there's a classic demo that I do a lot is one where um, I show three different ways of solving a problem and I can make any of those three things be the best way to solve the problem just by changing the data. So just the way the data is organized and how you're iterating through it, sometimes linear is your best bet. If you're jumping around in memory and stuff all over the place, log n can be slower than, than linear in many, many cases. So it's just, it just all depends on how the data is organized and you know, your, how, what processor you're on. If you're on a typical modern processor that has a you know, L1, L2, L3 cache, or even just L1, L2 cache, whatever, like memory hierarchy, then, you know, you actually want linear as much as you can, or at least, you know, data arranged together. So it gets, you know, it gets really complicated from here. But this is a good starting point to just think about the overall complexity of the thing that you're doing. So, yeah, anyway, hope that was helpful. I will see you next time.